Hello everyone and welcome to another Wilf Electronic ISOS webinar. My name is Markus Ebele and I will moderate this webinar today. We are very pleased that you took the time to participate in our webinar. The topic of today's webinar is using current sense transformers. Our speaker today is George Slama, who is working as senior application and content engineer at Wilf Electronic ISOS. He will hold today's webinar and also answer your questions. Before we start the webinar, I would like to point out one thing. You will be muted during the webinar today. This means that you cannot ask us questions via microphone during the webinar. Nevertheless, you have the opportunity to ask us questions during the webinar at any time via the chat function. You will find the chat function in the webinar control panel. Today's webinar will be about 30 or 40 minutes long. The chat questions will then be answered in a question answer session following the webinar. And there are 10 to 15 minutes in addition scheduled for this. If we are unable to answer all your questions within this time, we will answer them via email after the webinar. And if you still have any other questions left after the webinar, just email us at isos-webinar at we-online.com. You will uh, all also receive the link to the presentation as well as to the recording of today's webinar only in the next few days. So uh, now I will hand over to our speaker, George, and I wish you an exciting webinar. Uh, sorry, thank you, Marcus, for the introduction. Sorry about that. Um, as mentioned, this presentation is on uh, how to use current transformers. Um, in this talk, I'm going to discuss why we use uh, current transformers, uh, sometimes called current sense transformers. How do they work? What are the sources of error? What is transformer reset? And most importantly, how to select current sense transformers. I should point out that this topic is about high frequency current sense transformers, not line frequency uh, current transformers which are usually used for energy metering. However, the principles that we're going to discuss apply to all types. So why should we use a current transformer? <laughs> Measuring current is a very important part of energy management. There are many ways to use them, and each one places different demands on the performance. One reason is safety, and by this I mean detecting uh, current limits. These could be caused by overloads or short circuits and in a power system needs to respond in a controlled manner typically by opening the circuit in this type of application the current transformer needs to function under adverse or fault conditions so it should not saturate when i speak of control i mean measuring for specific current levels for the purposes of feedback control such as in a peak current detection in a switching power supply in this type of application, the final or only a narrow range of values are important. When I speak of monitoring, I mean the idea of knowing something is working, that current is flowing. The absolute values of current are not important as long as they're within a defined range. We just want to know that the device is functioning. And finally, by billing, I mean precise current measurements usually over a wide range for the purpose of knowing how much energy is being used. The most important application is at low frequency, which would be for sending you a bill every month for your electrical consumption. This requires good linearity, low error, and freedom from tampering influences. One of the biggest advantages of current transformers is that they provide galvanic isolation. This allows complete separation of the measuring circuit from the circuit being measured. This is easy to imagine the, in the utility world where high voltage lines with thousands of volts and hundreds of amps need to be measured and displayed on your uh, 0 0.9 volt microcontroller based computer. We would not want to route those wires near anything. It works the same way at the local level all the way down to the power supply. <laughs> Another advantage is the low power dissipation when compared to resistors making them ideal for measuring high currents. There's also a large sense voltage. When very low value resistors are used to reduce power dissipation when measuring high currents, the signal is also very low and therefore 
it has to be amplified, making it more susceptible to noise. The current transformer's output can easily be adjusted and is not constrained in the same way. The associated circuitry with the current transformer is very simple, only a burden resistor to convert the current to voltage. After that, any extra components depend on the application. No amplifiers or active circuits required. Large current transformers usually have a hole for a wire, which becomes the primary. But small types, which are surface mount, have integrated low resistance primary buses built in. So therefore, current transformers are small, rugged, and sometimes smaller than a sense resistor, which you can see in this photo. And you can also combine the outputs of several current transformers from different isolated circuits and use them individually or combined. You cannot do that with resistors. Current transformers can be grouped into four broad categories. DC, yes, you can measure direct current with a current transformer, but it's a little bit more complicated than what we're gonna talk about today. 50, 60 Hertz line frequency current transformers are a very broad topic because they include the utility scale. There they're used extensively for overcurrent and short circuit protection. But on a smaller scale, they're used for measurements, safety monitoring, and as I indicated earlier, for billing. High frequency current transformers are used in switching power supplies and motor controllers as part of the feedback and control system and overcurrent protection. That's our topic today. And current transformers can be used in RF applications, which would include measuring EMI. Common applications for high frequency current transformers would include industrial controls, uh, motor drives, power supplies, and SCADA systems called, which is short for supervisory control and data acquisition. Worth Electronics has three different sizes of current transformers designed for high frequency. All use EE ferrite cores in three different sizes, the EE13, the EE5, and the EE 4.4. The current handling capabilities range from 40 amps at the largest part down, up down to seven amps in the smallest part. All the parts are surface mount, but in the smaller parts, the smaller the part, the higher the operating frequency as I'll show you in a moment. So how do they work? Current transformers follow the same laws of physics as voltage transformers, but the difference is that they're current driven rather than voltage driven. This manifests itself in that the different elements that cause errors, as we'll see in a moment. Many current transformers do not contain a primary winding, which is usually just a single wire, as you see in this photograph. Here, the red wire on the left is a single turn, and the black wire on the right has two turns. The secondary current is proportional to the primary current divided by the turns ratio, just like a voltage transformer. The secondary is then connected to a burden resistor, which is used to convert the current into a, to a proportional voltage. We call this sensitivity and the units are volts per amp. You often see this warning, <laughs> never open the secondary when current is flowing in the primary. And it's true, but you must understand the context. First important point is that this is most often referring to mains or utility circuits. There the current is always flowing and the transformers have thousands of turns. Here's what happens. When a voltage transformer is connected to a circuit and the voltage is applied, there's a small current that flows through the windings, which you call exciting current to create flux. The voltage on the secondary is proportional to the turns ratio, but there's actually no current flowing it if it's open circuit. Remember from your transformer theory that a transformer transfers impedance by the square of the turns ratio. An open secondary is an infinite impedance, which is transferred to the primary and placed across the voltage source. This results in no current, which is what you want in a voltage transformer. When you add a load, the impedance will drop and the increased current flows flow will increase the flux in the transformer. But because the flux generated by the currents in the primary and secondary are opposite, they cancel each other and there's no net increase in flux for a voltage transformer under load. 
If we short the secondary, it transfers a zero impedance across the primary, and that shorts the source. That usually does not have a good outcome. Applying this to the current transformer, we see that the ideal primary would have no impedance because it's in series. This means that the ideal state for a secondary is a short circuit. If we add a load to the secondary, we're transferring that burden to the primary, hence the name burden resistor. Once again, the flux is generated by the windings cancel. If we open the secondary, the infinite impedance transfers to the primary, which tries to insert a high resistance in series, but the difference here is the current keeps flowing at its previous rate. There is no flux cancellation. The flux immediately increases until the core saturates. And we know from Faraday's law that the faster the flux changes, the larger the induced voltage. Now multiplied by a large number of turns on the secondary, this will result in a potentially dangerous voltages. In our context, we're working with smaller turns ratios, so the scale of problem is reduced. Here is a simplified equivalent circuit for a current transformer. The first thing you'll notice is that I've made the primary resistance RP and the leakage inductance is dotted elements. This is because a series is the, as series elements in a current driven circuit, they have no real influence on the performance. This is good because the typical primaries are often just a wire passing through a hole, so the leakage is actually high. This is not to say that the position of the wire in a toroidal current transformer has no effect, because it does, but the effect is small. Generally, the hole size is appropriate to the current being measured. I place the magnetizing inductance and the core losses on the secondary side, because that's where we can actually measure them. When they're on the primary side, it's a single turn, and it's very hard to get an accurate measurement. We can then use the turns ratio to transfer the effect to the primary side uh, when needed. We also have the secondary winding resistance in series and some winding self-capacitance and of course the burden resistor. The turns ratio reduces the current. You can see from this circuit that anything in series will not affect the current, but those elements in parallel will divert current away from the burden. This leads us to the sources of error. These sources of error apply to all current transformers, but depending on the application, some are more important than others. Leakage inductance is a series element, and it has a negligible effect, as we talked about previously. At high frequency, it can limit pulse rise time, but it's not normally a concern. Winding self-inductance capacitance, winding self-capacitance, on the other hand, does uh, have an effect because it limits the high frequency response. And this is exactly the same as you'd find in a regular voltage transformer. Winding resistance is another series element with little impact, except it does affect the flux density and the droop, which we'll see in a moment. Exciting current has the biggest effect. It's like a regular voltage transformer. It defines low, it defines the low frequency limit. It's important to understand that the exciting current is the vector sum of the magnetizing current and the core loss. Magnetizing current depends on inductance, hence the turns, permeability, and the core size. Droop is the sagging of a waveform. Droop results from voltage drop created by increasing current through the winding resistance. I'll show you this in a moment. Turns can be a source of error, though, although not often. B, B max, or saturation flux, and volt microseconds limits have to be respected to obtain linearity and functionality under all fault conditions. So these two previous errors fall into two categories when applied to current sense transformers. The ratio area error, error is the deviation from the ideal transfer of the primary current to the sense voltage. This is usually the main error of concern, except for power measurement applications where phase error becomes important the proper voltage to current phase relationship is needed to accurately determine instantaneous power. In this slide, I want to explain a little bit more about exciting current. 
When we speak of exciting current, it's the vector sum of magnetizing current and the core loss current. Quite often, magnetizing current and exciting current are used interchangeably, but they're not exactly the same thing. I've tried to illustrate this in a couple ways. If you look at this equivalent circuit on the left, we have a secondary current, IST, which is split into two currents, IEX and IS. Furthermore, the IEX, the exciting current, is then split into IM, which is the magnetizing current, into IC, which is the core loss current. We use a resistor to represent the core loss uh, current because cores typically have a resistance uh, and therefore we can model it as a resistor. This is the energy that's lost by traversing uh, the DH loop going back and forth. The react <clears throat> so the reactive magnetizing current is actually at 90 degrees out of phase with the core loss current. So together these cause a phase shift which is illustrated here. Note that this drawing is exaggerated. So you have the core loss current here plus the magnetizing current. The vector sum of that is the exciting current. If this long vector here is the primary current, this one on the horizontal line here is the secondary current times the turns ratio. So this plus the exciting current equals the sum here, but this error is, causes this phase shift, which we have is just measured here. So the lower the magnetizing current will be, the lower will be the phase shift and the, and the lower will be the error. <clears throat> Every transformer is a type of bandpass filter and has a frequency response. The lowest useful operating frequency is a function of the inductance and the saturation. And the highest useful frequency is limited by the winding self capacitance the core material and the losses. In this chart, I show three different parts that have the same turns ratio, which illustrate that size does make a difference. The large part with the highest inductance works in a low fre lower frequency range than the smaller parts, which have lower self capacitance. And by virtue, of their si by virtue of their size, a smaller part will have lower self capacitance and they can work out to higher frequencies, which you see here. In this slide, I want to show you an example of droop. Droop is caused by the exciting current uh, going through the winding resistance. As the current increases over time, the voltage drop uh, gets larger and this subtracts from the signal. Whether you have a rectangular or a ramp pulse, the droop is going to have some effect. Here you can see in this oscilloscope trace, uh, this droop here, this is called uh, droop. This can be corrected only by increasing the magnetizing inductance, which will, the inductance which will reduce the magnetizing current or to a less degree by reducing the resistance. So all current waveforms have a type of ramp. And then this is the drop. So you have the actual here, and then there's some subtraction. Here's another example to illustrate the droop on two different sizes of transformers, which is really the difference in magnetizing inductance. The waveforms are taken under identical conditions where only the, the transformers are exchanged. With two and a half times higher inductance, the EE5 in magenta has more signal at the end of the pulse mm -hmm. than the, the smaller EE4.4 in green, which has less, in, less inductance. This can be compensated for by adjusting the, the, the burden resistor to create more output. You can see here the different inductance values. It also should be noted that the smaller EE4 has more leakage inductance, and this causes more reset uh, voltage, greater reset voltage, which we'll talk about in a moment. In this slide, I want to show you the progression of the waveform as it passes through different circuit elements to get from a 10 amp uh, peak 
pulse all the way to an A to D converter over here where it's represented as a voltage. Starting on the left side, we have the 10 amps a peak pulse, which is immediately reduced by the turns ratio of the transformer. At point A, you see a little leading edge spike here. Uh, this spike is caused by the charging of the winding self capacitance. At the end of the ramp is turn off and the reset spike where the energy that was stored in, in the magnetic field and leakage injection gets dissipated. We see the voltage is high enough to overcome the diode drop of, of 1.6 volts. So we have 1.6 volts here. At point B, we see the diode blocks the negative spike from getting to the output where it would damage the IC. We don't want this spike to pass through. We see that the voltage across the 10 ohm resistor is exactly one volt for the 10 amps. The ferrite bead and the capacitor form an additional filter to remove the remaining spikes uh, from the signal. And then the series resistor here is added to match the oscilloscope's 50 ohm impedance. So at C, you have a scaled representation of the input voltage. Here's a typical application using current transformer for high side sensing and a two switch forward converter. It's easy uh, to do this because there's no concern about grounding and the output from the uh, when connected to the controller's ground. You can put the current transformer anywhere in the circuit, but the reason for putting it on the high side is because if you put it on the low side here, you're going to be including gate currents through these switching elements. So they would be add the currents that come through here would be added to the signal. So this only represents strictly the signal going through the transformer. Here are the most common circuit that you'll find for using current transformer and switching uh, power supplies with unipolar pulses. It consists of the current transformer, a diode and a burden resistor. The diode is not to rectify the signal, but it's used to block the reset pulse from going to the controller or the micro, uh, micro, which cannot tolerate negative voltages. <laughs> the important thing about the diode is it does affect the performance insofar as the reset is concerned. The voltage drop across the diode doesn't matter because this, this is a current driven series element. What does affect the circuit is the diode's reverse recovery <laughs> time, which determines when the reset pulse happens. The Zener diode in the lower figure is quite common because it provides a known a voltage like 12 or 15 volts for reset. The diode's job is to make sure there's enough voltage for a fast reset of the core. If the diode is very slow, it will cause a delay, which I'll show you in the next slide. But here you can see the reset pulses have different delays. So here's this diode you can see here. This is the delay for the reset is very short. This one, Zener has a, a longer time frame here bef before it resets. Otherwise, the output is identical. In this slide, I'm showing the effect of three different types of diodes with their reverse recovery time response and why it's important. <clears throat> the first is an ultra fast diode with a, a TRR reverse recovery time of 200 nanoseconds which is this blue line giving a normal response <clears throat> and a negative voltage at about 25 volts reset. The Zener diode in gray, which has a breakdown of 15 volts, has an approximate uh, TRR of 600 nanoseconds. This is not normally published in the data sheets. Its main virtue is that it limits the peak reset value to a controlled level. And finally, uh, a really fast diode like a 1N4148, which is very has very fast recovery time, just a few nanoseconds, uh, will give you a big reset spike, in this case, about 33 volts, and it may cause some EMI issues later. So if you use a regular silicon diode like a 1N4007, the delay is enormous, it's actually a few milliseconds and in, instead of nanoseconds, so you cannot use those for high frequency applications.
but the faster you reset, the larger will be your spike. So the Zener diode is often used because it's a controlled uh, value that you can that you know what you're going to get. This slide shows a few more combinations of reset circuits. <clears throat> uh, this one has added a, a resistor, which will dampen the reset voltage uh, so to reduce the spikes. But it also adds an error because it creates a bypass for the current, even though this would be kilo ohms uh, versus 10 ohms or less for a burden resistor. You can avoid this error by adding the diode in this circuit in series with the resistors. These two circuits over here uh, on the right use a voltage source to assist in the reset, making it very fast and controlled. The upper circuit moves the diode to the negative uh, bottom, which has no effect on the function, and then allows you connect to a positive source. The lower one uh, connects to a negative source. With these, you can achieve up to 90% duty cycles on times with a fast reset. One of the beauties of using current transformers is that you can combine them in many different ways. For example, in this circuit, which I took from a real power supply, <clears throat> the one I showed earlier with the two toroids, you have two different uh, transformer ratios. One transformer is on the primary side and the other current transformer is on the isolated secondary side. The primary one went back to the controller where it was part of the feedback circuit for controlling the pulse width and the combined output went back to overcurrent protection circuitry so it could detect uh, overcurrent on primary or secondary. These diodes uh, combine the outputs of, of both the R3 and R4, uh, the, combine the outputs in R3 and R4 form a voltage divider, uh, which you can use to uh, adjust the voltage a little bit further, finer adjustment. The thing to be aware of is that when you use these diodes to combine the, the voltage, you'll have to account for the voltage drops and you may need to start with a higher sensitivity. Also note that any capacitors in here will uh, slow down the signal and delay it a little bit. So how do we go about selecting your current transformer for your application? There are actually three steps that you can take. I'll go through an example in a detailed summary. One, number one is to determine the turns ratio that you need. Number two is, is to calculate the flux density or the volt microseconds. And number three is to calculate the error due to magnetizing current. Before you can start, you have to have some basic information from your application. For this example, let's use the following parameters. Uh, maximum signal voltage that we want is three volts. Maximum current to measure is 10 amps. The operating frequency is 300 kilohertz. A maximum duty cycle of 0.45, and ideally the burden resistor not to dissipate more than one quarter of a watt. So the first step is to determine the turns ratio, and we do this by calculating the sense voltage based on the power dissipation. We know that power equals current squared times resistance and must equal our quarter watt requirement. We also know by Ohm's law that the current times resistance equals voltage, and which we want three volts at 10 amps. So combining resistance equals volts squared over power equals 36 ohms, and current equals volts over resistance, which results in 83 milliamps. So current is proportional to the turns on the, each winding, and we assume that the primary winding is one turn. Therefore, 10 amps times one turn divided by 0 0.083 equals 120 turns. I'll choose 125 turns because that's the nearest standard product part. This will make my current 80 milliamps, and I'll need to adjust my burden resistor to 37.5 ohms. Knowing that I want 125 turns secondary, we know we need to determine we now need to determine the maximum volt microseconds that'll, that will be needed so we can select a part that has more. Since the turns ratio is fixed, 
different volt seconds will come from different sizes of transformers. The volt microseconds from the application side is comprised of three voltage drops, the current through the winding resistance, the burden voltage, which is the largest portion, and the voltage drop of the diode. We multiply the sum of these by the D cycle divided by the frequency, which is on time. The volt microseconds from the component side is the maximum flux density times the turns uh, times the core area. It's important to know that different manufacturers use different values for B max. So double check the data sheet. Ideally, you want to use something like 0.2 Tesla, but as you'll see in the next step, the accuracy that you want may make this choice less critical. Here we look through the various current transformers available, starting with the largest and working down to the smaller ones. You'll note in these charts that as the uh, turns ratio increases, uh, here you're going to see that the inductance also increases and of course, the secondary resistance will increase and the volt second product will increase. So these are all from the secondary side. Uh, the, the larger the turns ratio, the higher are, these numbers will get. Uh, also, as the parts get smaller, even with the same ratios, now you can see that the inductance is smaller and the resistance is smaller and the volt seconds are smaller as we get physically smaller but maintaining some of the same uh, turns ratios. And again, in this smaller part, um, again, they're small, uh, lo lower yet than they were in the previous one. But of course, as we get smaller, our parasitics get uh, smaller as well. Capacitance drops, so we can operate at higher frequencies and leakage inductance actually uh, decreases as well because it's physically smaller. So after looking through these charts, I've, uh, I've listed here all of the 1 to 125 ratio parts, which would work. And I, se I select the uh, EE5, which has plenty of margin as far as volt seconds is concerned. Um, but I also want to have good accuracy, which I'll show you in a moment. So the last thing we want to determine is how to calculate the error from the magnetizing current. This is determined by, <clears throat> by the magnetizing current divided by the secondary current. To get the magnetizing current, we would take the volt uh, microseconds divided by the magnetizing inductance. You may recognize this as the inductance formula. The volt microseconds, <clears throat> are as calculated previously, and the magnetizing inductance comes from the manufacturer's data sheets. In this case, we arrive at 2.8%. If I had chosen a smaller part, the error would have been larger because the inductance uh, would have been uh, smaller. This is not too precise, but we are not uh, including any core loss. So normally, which normally we do not get that information. But we're operating at a very reduced flux level. In our case, it's only 20 millitesla. So the core losses will actually be very low and practically neg negligible. Uh, magnetizing inductance on the data sheets is typically the minimum of value. So the error could e would be even lower. For, for peak current detection, we can always adjust the burden resistor to compensate if we need it a little tighter. So in conclusion, uh, current transformers are simple and effective. They, they provide safety through galvanic isolation. Uh, they have very low dissipation when you, measuring high currents. Uh, they can be used in many unique ways and, and they can be easily combined in circuits. Uh, they scale with frequency. So the higher the frequency, uh, the smaller the part. Um, They're very easy to interface uh, to power supply controllers and microprocessors. And with that, um, thank you for uh, your attention. And uh, at this time, I could uh, take any questions that you have. I'll give it back to Marcus and he can go from. Yeah, so thank you, George, for your interesting presentation. Yeah, as you have mentioned, now we would like to turn our attention to your questions. And so we wait a little until some questions come in. You can uh, ask us the questions with the chat function in the webinar control panel.
Yeah, so George, I see the first question here. Um, hello, do you have current transformer for low current? So uh, 0 0.5 amps max at 300 kilohertz. Uh, but high isolation voltage between primary and secondary of 4,000 um, VEC, or what is this? I don't know. <laughs> both, both, is, both is AC. Ah. <clears throat> yes. Uh, Thank you. So, um, the, of course, you don't, just because the maximum current on the current transformers is 7 amps or 10 amps or 20 or 40 amps doesn't mean you you cannot use them at, at lower currents. That's not a problem. Um, so you could use um, any of the smaller ones would be ideal for a half amp at 300 kilohertz. Uh, however, we, I do not believe that we, at this time, we have any with a 4,000 volts of isolation. Um, the, the surface mount, and I don't think there are any I'm not aware of any parts even from uh, in that we have that are 4,000 volts. The surface mount parts do not have enough spacing for uh, creepage and clearance that you would need for 4,000 volt isolation. So typically in that application, you they would use a toroid um, that I showed you in the picture at the beginning where you run a, a wire through. And those the wire that runs through that hole in the toroid can be double insulated or it can be triple insulated wire and then you can achieve creepage and isolation at the same time but the surface mount ones uh, do not have the spacing built in for 4000 volts but otherwise if you were just measuring low low currents at high frequencies uh, you could use any of these okay thank you george for your explanation then as we have a look at the next question, just a hint from my side again, um, you will receive the link to the presentation you just saw and also to the recording of this webinar only in the next few days. So you can go through the uh, material again. And yeah, uh, George, I see the next question. So it says, does the diode in the reset circuit effectively rectify the signal? Yeah, the diode is used, uh, it's not really used for rectification, but it does effectively rectify it. So we're measuring pulses and we want to reproduce the waveform. Um, so in unipolar pulses, the diode just passes the signal through, but it prevents that negative reset pulse because um, that would destroy an op amp. Uh, maybe not an op amp, but it would destroy a controller A to D that's not meant to take any, any negative voltages. So its main purpose is blocking. If you're measuring AC bipolar signals, maybe in a push-pull transformer, uh, a power supply, or even AC, you might you would use diodes in a bridge configuration and you would rectify the signal and then try to get a representation of the usually in those cases you're trying to get the average signal uh, and you rectify and you, you smooth it out with the filter so you get a dc voltage proportional to the ac current but in this type of application high frequency we, we want to rep duplicate the pulse uh, so the diode's main function is is to uh, protect as protection not rectification okay George, thank you again. And I see a next question. I don't know if I really get it right. I try to um, yeah, explain it right. So George, what is the maximum current sense transformer in the market right now? But I don't know uh, the maximum to what maximum <laughs> relates it. George, maybe you can yeah, um, um, know what is it about? Right, so in, in our in the ones that, that uh, Worth Electronics offers, we have uh, 40, 40 amps as the maximum, but that's not a, that's only a limit because these are surface mount uh, type transformers. You can measure any amount of current uh, into thousands and thousands of amperes um, if you build the right uh, current transformer, just like you can have voltage transformers from a uh, few volts to, 
millions of volts, you can do the actually the same thing with current transformers. Um, so I would say that there there's really no limit. I mean, utility size current transformers measure thousands of volts, uh, and pulse ones measure thousands of volts or thousands of amps. Um, so maybe you could clarify your question a little bit more specific to what you're looking for. Yeah, I think also uh, when there are some questions open, you can also just send us an email afterwards at isis-webinar at we-online.com and we will get in touch with you. So I think, um, yeah, that's everything for now. So we are finished with our webinar. So thank you very much for your attention and I hope you enjoyed our webinar. Also, many thanks to you, George, for your time today. Thank you. I hope you will hear us at our next webinar and I wish you a good day. Goodbye.